Dermatologist Clinic, and I'm the clinical lead for our Dermatology Day Centre, um, which is a centre where patients will attend sometimes several times a week to have topical treatments applied. And so the in the next half an hour, I'm just going to th talk through some of the practical tips on how to apply topicals and then practical tips also for other treatments such as phototherapy and systemic and biologic treatments. Um, and it follows on quite nicely from Emma's talk this morning, which outlined the sort of topical treatments that we use in psoriasis. I'll also include some sort of practical tips for everyday living, preparing for consultations and how to let escalate any concerns with psoriasis. And then right at the end, I'm going to introduce you to a project that we've been running in our day centre called Vital 5, um, which aims to kind of improve the holistic health of all our dermatology patients. So it probably sounds quite obvious, but as with all um, patients, we recommend that skin is kept clean. Often, um, the most common report that I will have is that patients will tell me that they're bathing or showering three or four times a day. Um, so our advice would generally be to wash once a day. Um, and we would recommend not being in the water for more than 15 minutes. I have to say, my son thought it was very amusing that I was advising everyone have a shower for 15 minutes. And when at home, apparently, I start shouting after four. So he likes to be in the shower a lot. So yeah, so once a day for 15 minutes and tepid water as well. I'm not sure of the effect of ice water. I know a lot of my friends at the moment are enjoying ice baths and, and cold water swimming. But again, something that people have said to me in the past is that they will often use very hot water because that will, re that will relieve any stinging or pain or any sort of sensations that they're getting from their psoriasis. And that's definitely something that we wouldn't recommend because that can kind of increase, um, it, it can could have sort of cause the psoriasis to reoccur as well. Um, patting dry, not rubbing with um, any sort of hard towels, so patting dry after having a shower. And another little tip is to keep a moisturising um, cream or an emollient near the sink. And that can be applied to your hands, but actually to any other areas of the body that you might be able to reach um, when you're in a bathroom. So um, Emma went through emollients this morning, and this is maybe a little bit of a, a refresh, but generally emollients work because they occlude the skin and they also increase skin hydration as well. They should be applied two to four times a day. But again, as Emma said, that can be quite a difficult thing to do. And again, I've got some sort of tips later on. Um, we, I generally advise that emollients are applied after bathing. Um, and the other little tip is not to rub it in. Quite often people want to rub um, cream or ointments into their skin. We would always recommend stroking in the direction of hair growth. And again, the best one for you to use is the one that you want to use. So if you're told to use an ointment, but actually you don't like to use an ointment, you don't have time to let ointments um, absorb into the skin, then if you're going to use a cream, that is a better one to use. We would generally um, recommend bland emollients. So you should should be able to get them on prescription you can also buy them over the counter as well um, other little good practice tips are if you have a pump dispenser that's fine but if you're using any in a tub it's worth using a spoon or a spatula to decant from just kind of minimizing any chances of infection all emollients should be discarded after 12 months. They should be stored in a cool, dry cupboard, so not in direct sunlight. But a little handy tip, especially now when it's quite hot, is if you keep a moisturiser and emollient in the fridge, you can apply it directly from the fridge. And that, again, can confuse the itch sensation and can provide some relief. You can use different emollients to different parts of the body. Sometimes you may want to use an ointment on your arms and legs, but actually on your face, you want to use something a bit, a bit lighter. And there has been an alert um, by the MHRA in terms of emollients. Um, there is a risk of flammability with them. So not only, you know, if you are applying an ointment, um, not to make sure that it's coming into contact with any naked flames, but any clothes that have emollients or ointments saturated in them, make sure that they are washed at a high temperature so that, that, that they are all removed as well. And finally, slips as well. If you're using... Um, um, if you're, if for instance, some people, we, it's very difficult for us to prescribe bath additives now, but you can put some emollient in the bath water um, just to be careful that you don't slip um, and, and, and then rinse it off afterwards so that for the next person who comes into the shower or bath water, they're not going to slip either. 
We recommend for psoriasis, sometimes on the palms of the hand and the soles of the feet, you can get hyperkeratotic skin, so you can get sort of a lot of scaling or sometimes pustules. And emollient soaks is something that we do quite commonly in our day centre. And this can soothe the skin and again increase the absorption of the emollient into the skin. Um, we generally use hydromol, and what we would do is we would we would decant a certain amount of it. A um, so about two tablespoons and mix it in a pot of warm water and then add that pot to a bowl um, and then soak the hands and feet for 15 minutes and then once that has been done you can then apply your active topical treatments which will often be steroids and then sort of enhance the effect of those even more with cotton gloves. Um, so this is again a bit of a refresher from Emma. So these are a list of active treatments that we use. Quite often you will need to use different active treatments on different parts of the body. So for instance, if you've got Enstelar or Dovabet, we would generally use that on the trunk and limbs. We would use um, a steroid on the face, say Umivate. And if you had any genital psoriasis, then we would want to use a steroid with a topical antimicrobial. Generally, we use something called Trimivate. So you may need to use different products for different parts of the body. We use um, crude coal tar and dithranol in our day centre and that's not something we can give people to, to use at home. So again, they will come into the hospital um, generally three times a week for that to be applied. And then there's also um, specials, so um, different combinations of products that are sort of endorsed, I guess, by the British Association of Dermatologists. They're harder to get by now, but they can be quite useful. We use something in the day centre, which is a mix of steroid and coal tar, which is in, in, incredibly useful, but we can only ever supply it in very small pots, and often patients have to wait for a couple of days before they can get it. Um, all active treatments will come with a product insert, and it is obviously always very well worth reading them. Um, products which are particularly important to make sure you apply them properly are if the steroid impregnated tape, it used to be called Helan tape, it's now called fluidroxycorticoid guides tape um, and again that's the list there you can there's a very helpful um, video and also a, a sort of website that you can have a look at the information Enstar as well um, has quite a good uh, website and it's quite useful to look at that as well because I think the um, you can get a bit carried away and want to spray it everywhere but again you should be targeting it to your plaques the website medicines.org.uk has the product insult inserts for all medications and um, so again you could just google any medicine that you've been prescribed if you've lost the the product insert and we would all as i've said already if you've applied emollient it's good practice to wait at least 30 minutes before you apply an active treatment to make sure that the emollient has soaked into the skin um, Another question we often get asked is how much steroid is the right amount to use? So steroids or combination products that include steroids such as Dovabet or Enstelar, um, we're generally looking at, looking at fingertip units. So if you squeeze out a ribbon of cream, the length of your fingertip, we would expect that to treat active skin um, equating to um, the size of an adult's palm, twice the size of an adult's palm with fingers included. And that works out about 0.5. That can be quite tricky to work out if you've got lots of plaques in lots of different areas. So another another phrase that we often say is glistening on the skin. So you would expect to see the product glistening on the skin. I've mentioned um, including steroids sometimes, and this should only be done under the um, advice of a healthcare professional, that you may be advised to apply a steroid and then occlude it, either that the plaster itself that you're given or the tape will have steroid in it, or you'll apply the steroid and then put a, a, a plaster over the top. Sometimes for hands and feet, we often recommend wrapping with cling film as well. But again, you've got to be careful that you don't fall and it should only be done under the care of um, a healthcare professional as well. In general, we would only do this for five days in a row and it should never be done at any point if anyone ever suspects they have an infection as well. Scalp treatment is really, really tricky to do on your own. And again, in order for scalp treatment to work, you often have to use three products in the right combination. Um, we've got some videos which demonstrate good scalp um, treatment uh, techniques, which I'll, I'll show you later on. But generally speaking, if I was seeing somebody with scaly scalp, I'd, need to, I'd want to prescribe something that's going to lift the scale from their head 
from their from their scalp. So that might be something which call, we call a, a keratolytic product, so Sebco or Cocois. We would want to leave that in place for two hours and potentially occlude it, so cover it to enhance its effect. In the day centre, we use cling film, but um, at home, people often use shower caps. We would then remove that by washing. We then want to use an emollient as well. Again, that might be a greasy moisturiser like Hydromol or Epiderm or something that will sort of um, soak, uh, absorb into the scalp. That can sometimes be left overnight. Um, and then you can lift the scale before um, washing by sort of using a plastic comb. And it is lifting, not picking. So you sort of bring the, the, the scale down the hair shaft. Um, and then after after that's been removed, usually with a medicated shampoo, um, we would apply an active treatment. So that would be a steroid preparation. Maybe it would be um, Enstelar foam as well. That can also be quite good on the scalp. Um, we often find that scalp applications can sting because they contain alcohol. So we would often use a lotion-based product first. In our, where I work in um, South East London, we have a really diverse community and something we've been aware of over the last couple of years is actually the advice we're giving to, for people with scalp treatment was very, was very much designed for people with Caucasian hair. And over the last um, sort of year, we've been, I've been working with one of our CNSs to really work on the patient education and scalp regimes for patients with Afro-Caribbean hair. And we're gonna have an article um, published very soon in our dermatological nursing journal. So again, if I'm talking to, if uh, our, my psoriasis patient does have Afro-Caribbean hair, I will spend the time to kind of work with them to see what their normal hair care routine would be. It may be that they only want to use a shampoo once or twice to prevent um, drying of the scalp. It may be that they want to wash their hair con with conditioner as well, and that's absolutely fine to continue. And then the active formulations that I would prescribe would probably be, probably be ointment based so that they're delivering the active treatment, but also um, moisturizing the scalp as well. It's also difficult for anybody with um, Afro-Caribbean hair to sort of remove the scale. So again, you're not going to ask them to comb their hair and remove scale down the hair shaft. Um, you might want to ask them to use a wide tooth comb to see if that works. And something else that we've all adopted, actually, is the use of um, silk and satin pillowcases. We all think that's really nice. But again, um, if you are prescribing for people, um, just be aware that some products may stain um, silk or satin pillowcases, which might be more costly than a, a bog standard cotton one. Um, these are our topical treatment plans that we use in our day centre. Um, and again, we find these really useful because, as I said, it might be that we're prescribing people five or six products to go home. A lot of them begin with E. So it's helpful if they're all written out and people know how to apply them and when to apply them. But sometimes I think it's quite useful if I don't have time or it's not practical to do this, actually just to talk through with people um, what their day looks like and when they can squeeze in topical treatments because it's not easy um, and everyone is always, you know, everyone is very busy and there are probably a lot better things to do most of the time. So again, it's about talking to people, you know, if you wake up in the morning and you have a shower, well, that's a good time probably after your shower to put your moisturiser on. You can put another lot of moisturiser on when you get home from work and then maybe before you go to bed, you put your... Um, put your active treatment on. And I think it's about breaking it down to make it workable for people. Um, this is the link to our dermatology videos. We've got a few out um, at the moment um, and um, they're two minutes long. They're all designed for patients. They all come with a downloadable patient information sheet as well. And because they're on YouTube, they can you can actually translate them into different languages as well. So they're worth having a look at um, if you if you think you'd like any advice or more information on the following topics. Um, I was just going to mention prescription issues because this is something that people mention um, quite a lot of me, quite a lot to me. Um, I'm still surprised that some people aren't aware of the prepayment certificates that are available. So if you are receiving a lot of products on prescription, you can apply for a prepayment prescription certificate um, via the website I've listed at the bottom. Um, you can either pay £31.25 for three months or just over £100 um, for 12 months. And that can sort of save quite a lot of quite a lot of money. And again, if people are having any problems um, or difficulties getting the right prescriptions um, um, or right amounts or right products from their primary care. And um, there are template letters on both the National Eczema Society and also the Psoriasis Association as well that can be used to help um, help uh, rectify rectify the issue as well.
There's also um, NHS app, which can be useful for ordering repeat prescriptions as well. And sometimes GP surgeries have their own apps. And if you're a carer for anybody else as well, um, even if, if your mobile phone number is not the number listed, you can sometimes have access to their records as well. And therefore, it can make it a bit easier to request, request uh, repeat prescriptions. So... If phototherapy, um, if, if topical treatment um, is, is not effective and you need to move on to um, sort of second line treatments, phototherapy is often a common, um, a, a common option. Um, in, the, in England or where we are, you have to come to our centre um, and that's the case for most places. I know in Scotland they offer home treatment because of the geographical um, distances people have to travel. They will actually be delivered their own um, uh, light treatment unit. But we would my recommendations would be to sort of make sure that you do have um, your appointments as directed. So try not to have large breaks in treatment because that may mean they have to um, start use different doses. Um, and also make sure you know which and when topicals to use. So sometimes you might not need you you might be asked to not apply certain topicals before you come for your light treatment. And do let staff know if you've changed any of your over the counter medications and supplements. Um, and another thing that I often get asked is, can I use sunbeds? Is sunbeds the same as phototherapy? Um, sunbeds are generally not calibrated and we are not calibrated to the same level that they are in hospital. Um, and so we don't recommend sunbeds in any instances at all. Um, systemic and biologic treatments and um, the dosing regimes for them so that the, the days and times you take them can be diff can be different so for instance if you start methotrexate you might start off on a small dose and then gradually increase it but if you're taking a biologic you might have loading doses so you might take more at the beginning and then less once you're established on treatment so again i'd always say make sure you know um, what your dosing schedule is and uh, i often rec recommend that people use their electronic or paper diaries to to diarise when they take their doses. Um, reliable sources of inf information, particularly to support you on systemic and biologic treatments, are the Psoriasis Association um, website, which have really good patient information sheets for all systemic or topical systemic and biologic treatments. Um, Skin Health Info, which is the British Association of Dermatologists um, website. And again, medicines.org.uk, which will have the product insert um, for each information as well. And many of the biologic companies also have a specific patient support programme Programs which your dermatologist team might um, might signpost you to. Um, it is important to, um, I think, to prepare for, for consultations and it's absolutely fine to come in with written questions or, or notes and think about what you want to get out of the consultation as well. Um, I always find it useful if somebody comes in and says, oh, my skin's flaring just before my next injection, if they've actually got a photo of what their skin looks like because that gives me a good idea of what's happening. And I think virtual appointments, as they become more and more prevalent, and I know for our centre we're not very helpful because we'll say we'll call you sometime before one o'clock it is useful if you're in a quiet space and undisturbed as well um i think for both you know it, it's um it's just as important that you have the time and opportunity to ask questions with virtual appointments as much as you do for face to face and again the psoriasis association have got a really useful guide on their website for preparing for virtual consultations and if you need further help and advice um again i think there's lots of different ways at the moment we can access diff um, medical advice in the foreseeable future, pharmacists are going to be able to prescribe for more. And although they can't prescribe for psoriasis at the moment, um, there's always the potential that that might happen in the future. But they're likely to be able to prescribe, certain pharmacists are likely to be able to prescribe very soon for common minor ailments such as earaches, sore throats, sinusitis, impetigo, shingles and infected insect bites. GPs. Um, and the, the other thing to remember is that if you can't access your GP, you can always call 111 and 111 may be able to make an appointment with your GP as well. Um, there are also urgent care centres. Um, and I think the advice at the moment is that you shouldn't go to A&E unless it is a life threatening situation. And at our site, um, at my centre, we do have a callback set, um, service for all patients. You can, we'll either call you or you can book a telephone appointment. And we like to um, say, I'd like to be able to say that we do call most people back within the same day as well. But we can't offer an emergency service. So again, it's, it's knowing which place to use when. 
Um, so I'm just going to now touch on the Vital Five, which is a, a project that we've been working on in our Dermatology Day Centre. Um, and this was a collaboration with King's Health Partner. And what we wanted to do was screen five vital health measurements. Um, and the reason for doing this was we wanted to identify risk factors um, early and also to help with health promotion as well within our local community. And Vital Fives is, is quite, has got quite, got quite a big aim, which is that in, in, in eventually what we'd like to have is a Vital Five dashboard whereby patients, no matter which healthcare setting they're in, whether it be their GP, secondary care or pharmacy, will be receiving the same information. Um, and the five measures that we thought we would look at or that, that have been defined been most useful are blood pressure, obesity, mental health, smoking status and alcohol. Um, and the reason for doing that is that those five um, measures are attributable to 40% of all these diseases. So those five measures um, are potentially worse than 40% of, of a num number of diseases as well. And it's also the biggest risk factor for ill health in our local population. And although we work in, you know, we work next to the Shard and, and the Houses of the Department, actually Lambeth and Southwark is, is in the 15% of the most deprived local authority areas in the country. But we were really aware, aware that if we wanted to do health promoting around these five measures, we didn't have unlimited resources and we didn't have a lot of time as well. So we had to come up with an approach that was workable within our current system. And so what we do is we use an approach called making every contact count. And that's an approach to behaviour change, so a means to make people, encourage people, sorry, not make, encourage people to change their behaviour that's promoted by NHS England. And what it is, is having a structured conversation lasting from 30 seconds to two minutes, whereby in that conversation, you assess somebody's willingness to, to change or, um, or, or improve and then deliver simple health measures. And it's been it's evidence based. So research has shown that this has a potential in promoting health change, both with patients and the staff as well, who are, who, are, who are doing it as well. And in alcohol consumption, one in eight very brief advice in al on alcohol um, has been shown to reduce alcohol consumption for one in eight people. So what we do is when um, you come to the day centre, we'd ask, we'd, um, we offer you the opportunity to have your vital five measured. And then if any of them um, require promoting around, then we would ask people. So, for instance, if somebody identifies that they smoke, we would say to them, you know, have you ever thought about stopping smoking? Would you like any advice about stopping smoking? If they say no, that's absolutely fine. We would generally want to kind of keep the door open and just say, if in the future you would like to um, think about stopping smoking, please come and, you know, please come and see us. We've got some advice for you. And if they say, yes, actually, that is something I'd like to think about or, oh, no, do you know what? I've tried five times before. It's never worked. We'll, we'll just say, well, would you like some information or can I refer you to our smoking cessation counsellor and, um, and then follow that through. So when we wanted, when we implemented this in the day centre, we were very keen that this wasn't seen as an extra or an as well. We wanted to make sure that it was really part of the package of care that we were offering. So we designed a passport um, whereby um, we would put information about people's topical treatments and then also information record their vital five, their five measures, and then also record the um, health promoting information and websites, and et cetera, as well. And what we did was, before we started doing this, we actually asked a number of our patients in the unit what they thought about us asking them about um, smoking and alcohol. Would they mind being weighed? Would they mind having their blood pressure measured? Would they mind us asking, um, giving them questions around mental health? Some of them have had it done already because we've got similar initiatives in some of our clinics, but not everyone did. But overall, everyone was really positive and everyone thought it was a really good idea. So we went off and trialled it on 10 patients to begin with. Um, and I think we knew that we were going to get high results, but I think all of us were quite shocked that actually nine out of 10 of the patients who were attending the day centre did require signposting. Um, and there were, you know, there were sort of people um, wanted to talk about losing weight and um, wanted referral to um, wanted referring to uh, stopping to smoking cessation. Um, we identified two two patients who were actually had had were having suicidal thoughts. 
Um, and there was a, the patient who actually we didn't have to do anything for at all. She produced a blood form that she'd been trying to get an appointment with her GP to get her cholesterol measured. Um, and she hadn't had time to go. So we took her bloods for her cholesterol as well. So this showed us actually that this was something that, that was worthwhile. After doing, sorry, after doing this pilot, we contacted all of the patients a month later and we managed to get hold of seven out of the 10 patients and they all scored the usefulness and the booklet nine out of 10 for being very useful as well. So that's something that we have now rolled out throughout our day centre um, and it's something that we're looking to implement in other areas. So our phototherapy in our community and also elsewhere in the trust as well at the moment, uh, community pharmacists are taking part in Vital 5 um, and our diabetic team and also our mass vaccination team as well. So it, it has been really useful. And in the last couple of minutes, I was just going to run through if anyone's thinking, well, what advice is there out there? These are generally the um, links that we signpost to. So for alcohol, um, we signpost people to the Drink Aware um, and also the Try Dry app. We've had a patient recently who wanted to start um, methotrexate but was drinking very regularly and um, I, we sent her away for three months with the Try Dry app. She minimised her alcohol, came back, we looked at the results and we've managed to start her on methotrexate. Um, smoking, all hospitals should have a smoking cessation team. Again, um, there are uh, different community pharmacies which are now set up to um, offer smoking cessation advice as well. And the NHS UK Better Health site as well is also really useful. Oh, it's not working. No, oh, that's better. Um, blood pressure around um, around the community pharmacy sites. This is the one that they've noted that they've picked up a number of people who've had blood pressures, which put them at a really high risk of stroke. So again, if anyone hasn't had their blood pressure um, measured, it's worth popping along to your GP to get that done. And there are sort of healthy checks that are done in primary care every five weeks, but often you can walk in and have blood pressure taken, or there's also blood pressure machines in pharmacies as well. Um, our signposting for blood pressure to understand a bit more about what you can do to lower your blood pressure and what it means, we use the British Heart Foundation website and they've got loads of really good resources there. Um, mental health, um, we, um, I was involved, and the Psoriasis Association supported as well, the all-party parliamentary group of skin report into mental health, in which was released at a very bad time. It was April 2020, so it kind of, you know, other things on people's mind. But that showed that 95% of people who had a skin condition felt that it impacted their mental health. Um, so again, that's something we are lucky to have a psychologist in our centre, but we can only use him and her for certain um for certain pathways. So for a lot of our patients, we do advise them and often help complete the referrals to um, Talking Therapies, which is the website which Emma um, put up earlier, and I've got it on here as well. And there's also self-help guides on if you look at nhs.uk forward slash mental health. Um, and there's also a, a psychologist who works with cystic fibrosis patients um, who has psoriasis, who started a website called copingwithpsoriasis.com. And she's got really good resources and nice little cartoons as well. Um, so if anybody hasn't had a look at that I'd really recommend having a look at that she's got a really good one about taking a dog for a walk um, and wondering if people are looking at her um, and, one, and and wondering what her psoriasis is and and it's just about her saying well no actually maybe the other people are um, thinking about what they're having for dinner I think I'm not explaining it very well have a look at that it's the coping with psoriasis.com um, weight management as well there are a lot of resources available in on the NHS um, to help people um, lose weight there's downloadable NHS weight loss plans but you can also get discounted um, programs for Zoom, Weight Watchers and Slimming World as well if you go to the Better Health site and again we know that the, that the heavier, you, heavier you are or the, heavy, the higher the BMI you are um, you know potentially the less likely your your biologic treatment is to work as well so it's really really important um to to have a look at these resources if, if you want to um and i think that's it and also sorry i've got to say there's also really good resources at the moment in primary care for men um so there are various football clubs at the moment which have schemes whereby um you can go along have a session with one of the football um training people and then have a talk on nutrition as well and i've had a couple of patients who've done that and found it really useful as well so it's worth checking out what you've got available in your local area um, and i think that's it for me thank you